the Around the NFL podcast. Runs the entire route tree poorly. Welcome to another edition of Around the NFL. My name is Dan Hansis. Got heroes here. Greg Rosenthal, Mark Sessler, very special edition of ATN. It is the one with the wide receivers in friends style. Uh, boys, we're going to dive deep uh, today on what is a very rich and promising wide receiver class. And I will say this, Greggy, wide rec- quarterback's always going to have the most juice, right? Uh, naturally, because they are the most important player. They can change the the fortune and direction of a franchise immediately. Uh, the most recent example, of course, being C.J. Stroud in Houston. However, to me, it is wide receivers that that gets my juice flowing in the sense of you want to fix your offense. You can do it overnight because these guys are now entering the league, and so many of them are instant, you know, number two fringe number one guys, some guys, the special ones are immediate superstars. Uh, So when you hear about this class in particular, it feels like we're going to get a couple of those this year and maybe more. That's a great point, Dan. Uh, Receivers on a rookie contract before like a CD lamb until he's going to get paid, whatever he's going to get paid this off season is such a ridiculous value. And I think the, the contracts top receivers are getting are kind of reflecting that, after quarterback, if you had to pick one position that you think is the most valuable, it's either left tackle, receiver, or edge, but it, it might be number one, true number one receiver, and there's only so many of those. And that, that's a bit of a flip compared to what teams thought about you know, 10, 15 years ago. I also like wonder if what we're experiencing with this draft class, um, you know, and it certainly stands out, wide receiver wise from from others they've been really but they're getting better and better and it's like is this at some point the new norm because i think like the one wa- starting to watch these guys like so many of them like usually it's like oh he's really good at this but he's got to work on this with nfl coaches to kind of get up to stuff so many of them look completely prepared to start right away and we aren't that far away from a time when like you could draft a wide out outside of like the what, top one, two, or three, and they're kind of ghosts until season two or even three sometimes. But these guys look like ready to roll immediately, a big well, chunk of them. They're out there doing those seven on sevens and, and the quarter, you know, quarterback camps and all that stuff, and they're practicing on air, and it's why I take exception to the, the money drop. I can run an out route. Walk, what's Walker's favorite thing in the world to go over to the middle school. They got a nice football field, which has some open th- and we're practicing quite a bit. We're throwing routes and um, I break off that route. I can get off press coverage. Right I mean, now. Greg, right. what if you're, you have like a six two, 200 and something pound cornerback jamming you at the line? How's your out, out route looking then? Well, I'm just going to duck under them. I kind of, I do this little move. Yes. I slip under. Okay. Slip under. You're undersized. You're 45 years old. Like, <laughs> Let's know our limitations, bud. Like, you can't play on the outside. You'd get manhandled. The route, like, the, the route tree is complete, though, you know. The idea of, like, again, you've, you've been down on Hunter Renfro in the past. Like, that's kind of your ceiling, bud. Like, that's what you have to operate in that realm. Uh, I'm, I don't want to be the, the bearer of bad news. Like, I'm an inline tight end blocker. Like, I, I know... No. And maybe hit me at the uh, at the re- in the red zone in a little misdirection. But I see like, myself at least I know as a 5'6", A.J. Green. You know. I mean, I, to, to say that Hunter Renfro is Greg's ceiling, it's like the ceiling three stories up on a building from where Greg is. Or, or any, I know, any I'm just trying to like rein him in somewhat. To, just saying uh, I've been putting in some work lately. Are you running these routes against we, your, your, we how old your son again? Way too much time. We got okay. that football. You know that football where it's got the routes on the football. So if I, yeah, I, I love need that to ball. check, you know, what's, what's a five uh, <laughs> route? Let's do it. Uh, no, right. there's no defenders there. Okay. And by the way, coming up just a little bit, Matt Harmon, uh, he of the reception perception fame, and we'll talk to Matt about what that means and uh, which players are really jumping out to him. Uh, But before we kind of get to Matt, yeah, I mean, every team can use a number one, right? Uh, Even the teams that have a number one. Uh, What's better than one number one? Two number ones. Uh, It's the second most important position, a backup quarterback. And the third most important, (laughs) the third is the backup backup quarterback. Uh, Charlie Cassidy, where are you, buddy? Um, Greg, who's a team or teams that really jump out to you that are going to be all over this wide receiver class when you look at what they currently have in-house? 
there there were so many when we did this exercise. Like I wrote down no less than fourteen. It's crazy. Like as as many good receivers have come in, so many needed. But Baltimore is one that I think is high profile that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Like Zay Flowers is not a one. Uh, Rashad Bateman is not a two. Aguilar would probably be best as a four. So they're they're not going to find a one most likely in this class, but man, they're counting a lot on Rashad Bateman right now. And maybe they'll pick up a veteran at some point, but that is a high profile team. And just staying in that division too, you kind of, you look at Cincinnati, the most Cincinnati move in the world is just replacing Tyler Boyd one for one in this draft with a slot receiver. I could see that happening. And then Pittsburgh, they have one receiver. It's George Pickens, who hasn't exactly been the most reliable player in the world. And they're, they're two and three is, I don't even know who quite, they, they really don't have a two or a three. It's Quez Watkins, it's Calvin Austin, it's Van Jefferson. So that division all those teams need receivers. The cycling, Browns are the only team that, that look pretty solid. Yeah, cycling back to, to Baltimore, I trust the Ravens in so many ways in terms of roster building, but they've proven time and time again that they they can't find a number one wide receiver if their franchise's life depended on it. Uh, not that Zay Flowers is a bad pick. I no, think he was a good pick. I think clear, you're right yeah. that he has the ceiling to be you know even a Pro Bowl player, but he's maybe not the number one. You mentioned Rashad Bateman. He was also a first round pick. Did, is there a third first round pick? Who's the other name you threw out there? Nelson Aguilar. Well, n- well not that there was, not with Philly. Aguilar's yeah. he was with Philly, nice but he was player. another high for a high round pick. Odell Beckham. They brought in last year, thinking he would uh, fill a role, and that didn't really work out either. So, would the Ravens go back to the well once again with the kind of the one blind spot when it comes to really to. identifying to top tier like, talent? You've got you brought in Todd Munkin, and they they. A, you know, correctly addressed wide out a year ago, but then you've lost, like, Odell Beckham's gone, and, like, you're kind of back where you started from, and, like, this is the draft class to do it. I think there's a couple teams, like, you know, it's a little more overt, but I, I see, like, coaches getting canned if they don't figure out what they're doing at wide out in some situations. Like, the Arizona Cardinals, they've got literally, they've got a fringed number two type of guy and nobody else, and it's like, they're in a weird place because it's like everyone points to them as the team that's going to trade with the Vikings to get Minnesota up to number four to take their quarterback. Um, but then it's like, okay, you pass on Marvin Harrison Jr. When like the most important player in your franchise history in the modern day age was Larry Fitzgerald. You can go get that player, a version of that player again. And it's like, I think Cardinals fans, they're really split and they're divided on like, wait, do we trade these? Do we acquire picks? and get lesser players, or do we get this guy who can change the franchise for 15 years, 12 years? I'm with you. The, all this talk that, like, oh, the Bears, should they take Roma Dunze at nine? It's like, he's not getting there because there's too many teams in front that will be taking receivers, and the Cardinals are one of them. And if the Bears do have a chance to take them, they, they should because they need a receiver. They've got, two, they've got DJ Moore. They've got Keenan Allen, who's a 32-year-old on a one-year contract and, and nothing else. And I look at the AFC East, and the Dolphins are all set. Uh, they're loaded. They have maybe the best one-two punch in the league with Tyreek Hill and uh, Waddle. Uh, but the Bills, their do- their str- struggles uh, oh, to yeah. have a real wide receiver room were well documented before they traded Stefan Diggs. So you would think they will be all over one of these prospects we're going to talk about with Matt Harmon in a bit. Uh, the Patriots are a team that is screaming out for some juice, and like who is a Who's it? now they're going to most likely t- target a quarterback at the at the top of the class, uh, but they could use wide receiver help. And you imagine they're going to go hard at, at this group. And, the, and then the Jets, who uh, have Garrett Wilson, who is a budding superstar entering his third year, who could be a monster if Aaron Rodgers stays on the field. Mike Williams was, I thought, a, a nice move to bring him in. But you can't assume Mike Williams is going to stay healthy coming off an ACL and all his issues. The Jets sitting where they are in the draft, like I'm of that – this, I'm of the thought, like, if Joe Alt is there, who's as flawless as a offensive lineman prospect, as as you as you'll see, if he is off the board by the time the Jets pick at what eight, I believe, um, ten. I'm going and grabbing one of the uh, ten. Is it? Sorry, I'm grabbing one of these wide receivers because uh, yep. they're gonna they're, one of these big guys will be there uh, because of all the teams that are picking a quarterback at the top of the fr- top ten. So that's a team that jumps out to me. Like that would be you want to get. As somebody who's obviously been struggling a little bit as a Jets fan uh, after last year's harrowing um, season, uh, if you pair Garrett Wilson with one of these gifted young players and then everything else they have, uh, Brees Hall and Mike Williams is a three, I mean, you you can really start to get excited. So we'll see if they go that route. 
Yeah, the, well, the Colts are a team at 15 that I think are in a nice spot. Like Brian Thomas Jr. to them is one of my favorite matches. But because of what you just said and because of going through the top 10 and thinking like, well, which team doesn't need a receiver here? I, I kind of think he'll uh, go higher than people expect. And we'll, we'll get to him a little more later. But like the Titans, they could still use a receiver. I know everyone just thinks it's tackle, tackle, tackle. They could absolutely use a, a receiver on that team still. The Falcons could absolutely use a ride receiver. Like even teams later in the draft, not that they're going to trade up for these top guys, but like the 49ers have to think about the future of replacing either Debo or Ayuk. The Lions, they love Amon Ross St. Brown, but he's an inside guy. And, you know, outside, it's like you're hoping Jamison Williams works out. It's Josh Reynolds. Like they, they need receivers. The Panthers are still short on weapons. They're just like so many teams to me. That's why I, I just think there's going to be what? 12 receivers maybe go in the first two rounds. It's going to be a lot. But you can't get this far and not mention, like, the Chargers, who, like, I mean, this sure. offseason's been a disaster on that front. I think, like, it's one of those um, times where what the draft provides couldn't match more perfectly with the way football operates right now. You don't have two. It's not 1986. You don't have, like, one wide receiver and a number two and a bunch of tight ends and fullbacks. You, you need four or five of these dudes. Not to mention we're coming off a somewhat meh year from wide receiver um, yes. in 23. So the, those teams... Uh, that have been looking for wide receiver help that weren't able to get it in most cases last year. So now uh, it goes down that road. And I, I thought you were going to go in a different direction, Mark, in the AFC West. We cannot end this co- part of the conversation without mentioning the defending champion Chiefs who pick mm. at 32, who made a move and got Hollywood Brown, a move I wasn't in love with personally. And it's it seems so obvious to me that there there's another move coming. My question is, do they sit where they are or do they really go aggressively up the board and try to get one of these big boys? Uh, because that would be the talk of draft night if they do. Get aggressive. All right. Anybody else want to throw out another team? We could just do that whole division because the Broncos, like, the Broncos sneaky need everything, but they have Cortland Sutton and then just a lot of question marks. Tim Patrick, Mims. I mean, it's not the worst receiver group in the world, but again, there's so few of these teams that you couldn't, see like a second round picket receiver helping. I waited so long for it not to be a conversation anymore, but now that it's here and gone, I, I miss it. Like, but you know, Cortland Sutton and uh, Jerry Judy, uh, they could be dynamic. <laughs> Going to miss that conversation. Are you? You can still talk about him <laughs> in Cleveland. You know, Jerry Judy, he's, he's the long term future. As a Cleveland, are we cool with the Browns, Mark? With uh, Mark no, I'm, Cooper I'm getting not up there? because I, I, I think what they've done is is kind of interesting. Like Judy and and Elijah Moore, like represent players that other that haven't had breakout success on any level. They've been frustrating. You can see it a little potential, but other teams gave up on them. And Amari Cooper is getting up there in age. I thought he had a great year last year, but like that team, like has to feel as all in with their financial situation, everything else as anyone as anyone out there, but they don't have a lot of draft picks, but I would absolutely want them to get a wide receiver. You know who absolutely. really helps them in that realm as a playmaker? That David Njoku. He's quite a player, Mark. He's a good player. I've come around on that. <laughs> All right. With that said, let's uh, take a quick break. And when we come back, we will have Matt Harmon to break down some of the young wide receiving talent about to flood into the league And all those teams we just talked about, many of them, well, all of them are going to be jockeying for these guys. And we'll find out in a couple weeks who gets them. We'll be right back. To the end zone. Caught. Touchdown, Harrison again. Rising to the occasion is Marvin Harrison Jr. Bowers heading to the end zone. Man, is he devastating after the catch. That's Brock Bowers. There's the shot to a dude. Welcome back. Yes, it's the one with the wide receivers episode. And we uh, just talked about what teams are going to be aggressive on draft weekend. Targeting wide receivers, the teams that make sense. But now let's talk about the wide receivers themselves that are entering the league. And it's a potentially historic wide receiver class. And we think wide receiver, boys. And you think the NFL and you think about route trees and you and you think about the receptions but you f- 
think about the perception, don't you, as well? <laughs> Matt Harmon, welcome back <laughs> to Around the NFL. <laughs> oh, man, Dan, thank you for that intro. Um, I, I got to think about stealing that for like the start of our own podcast. Uh, yeah. that, that, is, yeah. that is pretty good. So I'll have uh, my lawyers <laughs> talk to your lawyers and maybe we'll come to sort of an agreement on, on buying that IP there. No problem working a little bit blue to make a point. Matt, of course, a former colleague of ours at NFL Media was a fantasy guy. And as he was a fantasy guy, he he created the mythology Reception Perception, which has its own website, which you could check out. And uh, Matt is all over that. Uh, and also, of course, does writing and analysis for Yahoo. So, Matt, uh, welcome back to the show. And it's always good to see a friend. And yes, uh, even though you said it before we came on, I'm now going to steal that little bit of pre-show banter. You've moved away from the swoosh hairstyle. Then I saw you when we lived together in El Segundo before you moved back east. You said, I'm a hack guy now, and that surprised me, quite frankly, as a fellow follicle guy, disappointed me. And now you got the Travis Kelsey <laughs> fade. Guy. So it looks like you're not a hack guy after all. Uh, I, I would say I'm like a 50-50. You know, um, when the weather is nice and, you know, you're doing a lot of sweating, uh, it makes it, mm. it's nice to have the hat. That's good. That's that's a nice call. You know, I mean, look, look Dan, see, you're a gifted hair guy you're a, or a follicle guy in Thank your you. words, and you're wearing the hat right now. Um, mm. So, I mean, you know, it's it's good to be able to do both. Versatility as you get older is important. Fair. It's not an incredible upset that we've spent the first 40% uh, of this interview talking about Dan's uh, hair. <laughs> It, uh, also, you're we're too old to do the Travis Kelsey. At least I'm speaking for myself. I'm I'm much too old. But you you pull it off. You look like you could be the unathletic uh, third brother of the Kelsey. I mean, uh, I I think I'll 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 take minor offense to the unathletic part because uh, I I do like to say that I I work out. I'm 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 a gym guy as well. Uh, but at the same These time, two Hall of Famers, Matt. You know, well. <laughs> Listen, I, if Greg, I hit my peak, little, why... if I hit my peak a little earlier, I think I could have gotten there. No, but in all seriousness, um, I, I just want to say for the record, yes, I don't want to call it the Travis Kelsey. You guys can call it the Travis Kelsey, but officially, <laughs> it's a, it's not the Travis Kelsey. Just 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 to get that on the record. What is it? What is what is it? The because uh, my my haircut is the modified gentleman's contour, famously. <laughs> what it, what is yours called? Just a, it's just a fade, just, just a regular fade. old fade. <laughs> okay, okay, but enough honking. Let's focus up. Hair is great, but these wide receivers, my own, Harmon. And uh, can you give people that maybe are not familiar with the reception perception model, like how you how you came uh, to study the game this way, wide receivers and playmakers this way, and what it what it tells you, and and then we'll get into some of the players in this draft class, which obviously have to be very exciting for uh, what you do. Yeah, wide receiver business is booming right now. That's for sure. But. Um, what reception perception is, is the methodology that I created around like 2013, 2014, 2014 was the first year that I, I tracked league wide data with reception perception or, or close to league wide data. I'm not charting every single player in the league and, and certainly not every single college prospect. That's for sure. But what I do is I go in over eight game sample for NFL or college prospects when the film is available um, and chart every single route that they run, where they line up, really try to give you a view of what a wide receiver is doing in isolation, because all those years ago, my thought was you know, you're lucky if you're a receiver, you get like eight to 10 targets a game, but you're running, you know, 30 plus routes a game. You're playing like 60 plus snaps a game. If you're a true number one guy, and we all know the quarterback or wide receiver production is so inherently dependent on quarterback is dependent on pass protection is dependent on like the environment that they're in. And even we know this more now, even maybe more than we did 10, 11 years ago, that a wide receiver is not a wide receiver, right? Like they're, these guys are so different, even if they all have WR next to their name. So reception perception through that charting data that I'm, I'm the only one doing the charting. Uh, you know, James Coe, my business partner, would love to maybe take some of that love work Co. off my hands. Yeah, we, he'd love to add some more people to the team. But to me, you got to pry the charting away from uh, like my cold, dead hands, man. Uh, th that's mm. why I love to do this is actually the, the grunt work of it. But through that charting data, it tries to give you a real picture of who a wide receiver is in isolation, away from their production, um, you know, for a variety of different reasons. Try to categorize these guys, try to understand them within their roles and obviously from a you know for fantasy fans you know you want to try to spot a breakout before it's coming i was going to ask you real quick like have you um the same way you know pff started their own way to you know track mythologize like play like have you had nfl teams or scouts uh of that ilk reach out to you about about what you do Every now and again, um, if there are any NFL folks wanting to, you know, pay me a bag that listen to this show, I'd, I'd gladly do. You guys know sure. this as, bi as big media bros, like consulting work. That's where it's at. Mm. I'd, 
uh, hire me as your consultant. I'd, I'd love to do it. Um, I don't know if that <laughs> would require me taking, uh, you know, information off the site to my loyal subscribers, but really I'm a man of the people, Mark. Um, I, I'm out there for the folks that can afford a, you know, $30 subscription uh, to learn about wide receivers. Whenever, but, uh, hey, if, if it works out, it works out. Whenever I meet somebody and they tell me they're a consultant, they're almost always uh, very wealthy. So that's something I want to get into one day. All right. So with that in mind, let's get into it. Uh, and we kind of built up the the ATN heroes here, some su superlatives, and we're going to tee you up and, and you could tell us which one of these prospects, because we're hearing what three out of the top eight picks, maybe to start the draft could be wide receivers, maybe even uh, better than that. We'll see. Uh, but it's not just the big three. There's a lot of talent in this draft. So let's start here. The 2024 reception perception man crush award winner mm. is Oh, uh, I'll just start off with Roma Dunze there, because to me, I don't watch college football uh, on on Saturdays. You know, I'm a happily married man and I already ruined like three days of the week with NFL work. It would be kind of hard to justify to Mrs. Harmon. Like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to ruin one more day of the week by watching <laughs> a bunch of college football. It's something that doesn't really have anything to do with my job. So I'm not super familiar with these players before watching them for the draft other than obviously I knew Marvin Harrison Jr.'s name and knew the hype around that particular player so uh, coming into this process I didn't really know anything about these guys but the first time I put on the film of Roma Dunze I mean whatever superlatives you have for this exercise boys I could probably say Rome's name for most of them mm. uh, because I think he is just so good at everything I think he's an extremely clean prospect you know he lines up on the line of scrimmage as a true X receiver which is not something we could say about last year's draft class right like last year's draft class it was a lot of guys like Jackson Smith and Jigba, Zay Flowers, even Jordan Addison, these guys that were going to play off the ball and be more of the kind of complementary players. All three of the top receivers in this draft class are, are not of that ilk, although Malik Neighbors doesn't really line up as that true X, but specifically Rome, like he's just out there doing NFL things, running NFL routes. I love the way he gets off the line of scrimmage against press coverage. I think he's a great separator, really kind of underrated as a separator because he has all these contested targets on his resume, but a lot of that is the fact he's running downfield routes. He has a quarterback who's willing to trust him in those tight areas. To me, he just looks like kind of a – I did prospect comparisons, like aggressive and cautious comps for uh, for a Yahoo video series this year. A cautious comp for him was Allen Robinson, like another guy that just – you can line him up at X back in his prime, and and you could win there, you know, it's kind of short to intermediate, but also be, be a contested catch threat. My aggressive comp for him was uh, Devontae Adams, another guy that – you know, wins at all three levels, great route runner, nice separator, pretty like a, a solid tackle breaker after the catch. And obviously someone you could throw to in contested situations like a, hey, hey, you funnel 30 percent of your offense to this guy and you never think twice about it. I do think at his peak, Rome could be that guy. Here's a comp from Daniel Jeremiah. He sees Larry Fitzgerald as a comp coming out of college, uh, which is obviously high praise, too. That's a Hall of Famer. Mark. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, watching him, um, the contested catches stand out. I feel like he had defenders in his beehive, and he'd come down with the ball. But also, a lot of it is with these college guys. Like, you've got these quarterbacks, but like, paired with Michael Penix Jr., I felt like they had, like, 10,000 catches or combinations that were, like, 40 yards downfield where it just was, like, it, he, he could do no wrong. And, like, I'm with you. I came away just kind of in love with this guy. So I love what you said. Yeah, there's so many. You mentioned the X receiver, even even the ones further on, and we'll get to them. It seems like in compared to the last couple of classes, there's like six, seven guys that you could see as as number ones. It, the thing I was worried about going into it, and and you can tell me how the reception perception worked out for Roma Dunes. It was like whenever the first thing you hear is contested catch guy, that's been a bit, almost been like a red flag for yeah. players in the last handful of years. Drake London's a bit of an exception. I, I think he's kind of made his style of play work in the NFL, and he's gotten better but you're seeing a dunze maybe a little more subtle with his route running a little more versatile than maybe just positioning him and he's kind of turned into wide receiver three we'll see if the nfl agrees with that or not but it, it he's kind of landed as a three even though at the beginning of the process guys like jeremiah maybe had him as higher higher than harrison or neighbors it doesn't feel like a lot of people uh, believe he's going to go ahead of them. You you seem to think he's a little more versatile though, and and you would put him ahead of him, would you? I I had him. I had a long kind of internal debate with myself. Uh, you know, th my war room up here, me and the two dogs. We had a long internal debate of like who was the wide receiver one in this class. Which to me, I think. I was close to making it Rome. I eventually maybe uh, just broke a few ties in favor of Marvin Harrison, but Rome is the second guy to me, and Malik Neighbors is the third guy. Now, my mission statement with this draft class 
these top three guys in particular, like I, these guys are all so close. They're all great prospects to me. They're all tier one prospects on my stacked board for the last four classes. So like you like this guy over this guy, that's fine with me. You, you want to take this trait over that trait also fine with me. Um, it's kind of reminiscent. You brought up Drake London. It, to me, this is reminiscent a little bit to that draft class where like you could put Drake number one, you could have put Garrett Wilson number one, you could have put Chris Olave number one, and I would have been fine with that. Ultimately, I went with that year, kind of the route running craft guy, which was Chris Olave, and then you know, I, I then Drake London, then Garrett Wilson. To me, I think I'd probably flip that up now that they're in the NFL. But I see this group as very similar to that. It could, it kind of depends what type of player and what what number one receiver you you value in terms of a traits perspective. But yeah, like on the separation part of it, it was a very similar exercise with with Drake London, where you actually had to watch him on film and and see the routes develop to like know this is a guy that is getting open early in the routes and maybe gets thrown into some of these contested situations. Like Terry McLaurin's always kind of high in the NFL in terms of percentage of contested targets, but I don't find any issues with his separation. I think he's just played with some erratic quarterback play and, and Michael Penix is a good quarterback, but he is a little bit of an erratic passer down the field as well. Mm. Uh, all right. I'll throw, I'll throw it out. Yeah. And, and look, Rome could have been the answer to this, but now you're gonna have to pick someone else. All right. The wide receiver in this class that would have, been a number one would have been the number one receiver in last year's class uh, yeah well, you could go with any of the top three guys I think you could honestly make an argument um that even like Brian Thomas and JSN kind of have similar grades in terms of last year's draft class but I'll say Malik Neighbors as the obvious guy here um and another one that to me is my wide receiver three but easily with a bullet would have had like a tier break between him and any of the players last year Neighbors is very fun. He's he's like an easy player to love because I think it takes like three plays to see, oh, this guy's different from an explosiveness standpoint. Um, like I mentioned that 22 class, I'll bring it up here again, that he's kind of the Garrett Wilson of that draft class to me where he's a little bit level like a wild horse route runner. He's not the most refined player, but he's so explosive with the ball in his hands. And if he just continues to develop, you have a lot of confidence, just like I think Garrett Wilson has developed into a true number one at the NFL level. I think neighbors could do that, too. One thing noticing watching him is like I love the seeing the body language of the poor individual that's forced to try to cover him <laughs> because it's yeah. the kind of like the way that you watch a sprinter at the end of a race where he's bending his for, like upper body forward to try to hit the tape first. And these cornerbacks like are losing control of their bodies and like he's catching passes nine or ten yards ahead of them. And I just think he's like the kind of guy that could like break someone's spirit by the end of the first quarter in the NFL. He he yeah. seems so reliable, but like so flashy at the same time. I mean, it maybe it is the LSU thing, and I'm just a simpleton, but he really did kind of remind me of Odell. Or like or like a li little bigger Steve, Steve Smith type where he's just got such a natural feel as a runner and he has great hands. So I hear you that like maybe he's a little rougher around the edges running routes or something, but he just seems very easy to project in like any of these systems that like he doesn't need to even get any better to just like immediately just put a thousand yards plus up there. The only thing with him that's different from these top two receivers is he does play out of the slot the most, which I mean, who cares? It's not that big of a deal, but 50.3% of his sampled snaps in reception perception came from the slot. He was more of like a split between on the ball or off the ball, but that's totally fine. Like you can funnel your offense through that player, but it's similar uh, to kind of DJ Moore coming out of the, the NFL draft where the guy, but kind of like a two X version of that type of player where he was rough around the edges from a route running perspective, but he was explosive and you could see that he was going to develop that in the league. That's why I'm not like, I I'm not docking him out of my first tier of prospects because he's just the least refined of these three players. He's also like not even 21 yet. I don't think he turns 21 until mm. after he's drafted. So he's a guy that you do feel pretty good about that growth. But like you said, Greg, his explosiveness and his ability to break tackles, which in my opinion is easily the best in this class. And I think it's actually the best of like the last three classes, his ability to make plays in the open field. It, like that gives you like a floor for any, if you're a team like the giants, which I know it's weird with the giants because they a lot of things are weird with the Giants, but they don't have they have a lot of like these slot guys, right? Like guys who have played mostly inside and neighbors is a mostly inside guy at LSU. But it, it feels like they need someone to just say to Danny Dimes or maybe Drew Locke at some point, like this is your first read. He's going to run a crossing route or a dig route, something like that. And you just get the ball to him and, and, and worry about the rest later it feels like a good way to start to kind of build a foundation on your offense. That's the Jets offense with Garrett Wilson the last two years, basically. Yes. Yeah, correct. <laughs> which is why, which is why I kind of see those two guys similarly. 
Um, all right, here's one for you. Uh, I'm not Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, or Roma Dunze, but I have the best chance to put up number one type numbers as a rookie. Mm. <clears throat> if we're just talking numbers, depending on mm. depending on where he's drafted, I I, I kind of think it's got to be Brian Thomas, uh, who's the consensus wide receiver for. He's my wide receiver for in this draft class. I don't know if he has. He definitely has the ceiling of a number one, but I, I think he probably projects best as like a high end number two. He only runs like three routes. I mean, in his reception perception sample, 67% of his routes were a slant, a curl, or a, or a go route, and that's it. It doesn't, mean, is, he, it doesn't mean he can't learn it. Correct. Haven't we kind of learned that with, with wide it's, receivers and these weird was, systems that they can learn it when they get there? I was just going to say, like, and you, but at the same time, his success rate on a wide variety of other routes is really high. Like I think he does show the skills to expand that route tree, but it gives you kind of like, if you look back at DK Metcalf's rookie season, 67% of the routes that he ran as a rookie was a slant, a curl or a go route. And so I think that's sort of the development plan for Brian Thomas. But if he lands with the right offense, like I think about the Colts at 15, make a lot of sense. Mm. Like you have a guy in Michael Pittman that you're going to throw the ball to a ton in the short to intermediate area. And then you have Brian Thomas just kind of ripping you on the routes that you wanted Alec Pierce to win on. That makes a lot of sense to me. Just from a pure numbers perspective, I think he could put up like number one numbers and then maybe eventually grow into that player. He, he's the guy I was hoping you would say for the last one because I don't have many draft takes. We're, I, I'm personally like a, like a student who's just studying for the test at the very last minute and then like is overconfident going into it. But my one overconfident take is like, you can't take Brian Thomas Jr. too high. If I didn't know anything about it, I'm just sort of basic. If I didn't know anything about where these guys were and you just watch Brian Thomas's six games, you're like, wait, why is he not a top five pick? Why is he not? A, like, cause his stop and start and his ability to move so smoothly at that size is just insane. Like, it's just as insane. I, I kind of see his ceiling, like, in a perfect world where it all went well, is, like, just as high as those other guys. And I get it. Like, he used to be a, a basketball player. He, he ran a limited amount of routes. That, you know, some of these deep threats from the SEC, like, like J-Mo, uh, haven't totally worked out. And I, but a guy that huge that can run like that, that can stop like that, like, he looked like Nico Collins to me mm. looks now. And Nico yeah. Collins is great now. And I was like, if he looks that good now and he's this age and like his testing is off the charts, like he could be Nico Collins plus plus, which is which is like a top 10 receiver. So like I, I wouldn't be shocked if like if the Falcons or one of those teams takes him in, in the top 10 just because of mm. the way he looks. If a Dunze goes early, like I don't see why he wouldn't go against ahead of some of these defensive players or, or tackles, too. But maybe I'm stupid. You're not stupid, Greg, but I think the good the good thing That's with Brian Thomas is <laughs> <laughs> the, the good thing with Brian Thomas is you also saw him get get better throughout the year, right? Like I think a lot of analytic models will ding him because he only has this one big year of production, but that production number one was earned, and number two, like you saw him on film get better. Like the the, the September routes are not as good as the December routes. Like the later games, he's getting better and better. He's already making that development, that projection that you kind of want him to make. And I, I just love the idea of him across from a competent number one. So that Atlanta spot makes a lot of sense too, where you're, you're getting the most out of him. And then, you know, Drake London's your Michael Pittman from the example that I gave earlier. All right. So along those similar lines to Mark's question. So we've now hit on the Mount Rushmore here, if you will, of prospects at this position. Let's talk superlative for sleeper stud. So who's flying under the radar here a bit as a 2024? I'm not saying superstar or number one wide receiver, but a guy that steps in and is an immediate difference maker, like a Nico Collins, and then he develops and turns into a star. Like who is the difference maker that people aren't talking about? I really like Ricky Pearsall is kind mm. of my favorite guy that's in a few tiers down. Fun player. Um, I think he's a really good route runner. To me, he seems like a guy that's just going to be a quarterback's best friend very early on because he's really good on like slant routes and flat routes and these sort of just routes around the line of scrimmage. But he's got legit juice down the field. Um, he's a guy that you see on film play all three positions. So you see him a little bit at X. I think his most likely home in the NFL is going to be as a flanker slot, like a guy that moves between those two positions. Um, someone that I think has that sort of floor that you're talking about early on, Dan, where he just gets open against man zone coverage. It's a little more average around press, but again, there are ways to hide that. 
You get him working around the line of scrimmage. He's a quarterback's best friend. He's always at the right landmarks. He's always at the right place in terms of where you want him from a route running perspective. But I do see the upside for him to develop into like 120 type of target player in year two, year three. Uh, I, I think that there's a chance that he goes higher than people think just because he checks a lot of like athletic measurements as well that you really want to see. So he's been a guy that outside of the first couple tiers of this class that I've really gravitated to from, I, I, I don't know about sleeper perspective because more people are talking about him now than they were at the beginning of the process, but definitely a player I like. It's the draft process. Everyone talks about everyone at some point. Right. I'm almost disappointed though that, that he was your answer because he's really one of only two options uh, for my next category, which is just um, white guy that Mark is going to fall in love with. There's <laughs> really only two guys, uh, probably towards the top of the draft, unless I like double yeah, dig. Yeah, but Greg, study. it's the other guy, so it, you set the yeah. table well. Oh, okay. I'm just, well, it's up to Matt, though, to guess. There's no way the guy isn't Lad McConkey. I mean, there's just I mean, no it's way. It's got to be. It's got to be. <laughs> I but, love the, him. but the. The great, of course, but the the best part about Lad McConkey <laughs> somewhere is that Zach Zenner just got like a shiver and he's like, someone <laughs> is thinking of me. Wasn't Zach, Zach Zenner was in the news for something recently, like uh, so in two thousand six during the preseason, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I swear to God, I saw something about like he went back to school or, or started a business or something. Oh, good. So I'll, I'll I'll deep dive that for you, Mark, and send you the article after Thank the uh, after the show. Um, but yeah, Lad McConkey. The great part about him is that he's not just your typical like lunch pale gritty white slot receiver um the guy legitimately wins on deep routes and like actually in terms of reception perception the game sampled here he was more of an outside receiver you saw him play a lot more now he does struggle against press coverage he does struggle again in like contested situations but again those are things you can get around from like a, a deployment perspective you can move him inside you can also move him off the ball like so many of these receivers now i think are going to have their worlds opened up by how much motion is going on in the NFL right now, especially these like full speed motions that a lot of smart coaching staffs are, are using. So McConkey could be a guy there, but like, I think he runs the best out routes in the class, like just pure mm. I'm selling vertical routes. And then I, I break to the outside. That's lad McConkey to me. His success rate on out routes is among the best in the class. It's among the best of the last few years. So when I was trying to think of like a comp for him and, and go beyond the gritty white slot receiver comp, cause I don't really think that's how he, he plays I like went into the RP database and looked like who has some of the best out routes since 2014 and Tyler Lockett popped up as like a comparison player. And I think that's sort of the kind of the bucket that lad fits into. If he can play inside, he can also play outside and he's more of a speed based slot receiver when you do line him up there. Um, I've got one for you. Like if you, Matt Harmon had to write like a Shakespearean sonnet um, to, uh, you know, not one of the stars that we've talked about, but like a girl next door type of wide receiver. That's a weird way to put it, but just like a little under the radar, like who would you um, pen the sonnet to and of your affections? Uh, Pearsall would have been an option, um, but you know, I'm intimidated by the leg tattoo. So I'll go with Malik Washington, who actually uh, went to school in Charlottesville near where I live now in Virginia beach guys, just like a fun player. Um, I, I don't know what the ceiling is for, you know, a smaller receiver like this that really only has like one year of major production, but I mean, he's got fantastic hands. He breaks a ton of tackles. Like, he plays bigger than his size. So if I was writing kind of that sonnet to a player, mm. um, I definitely think I'd pick Malik Washington as kind of the deeper sleeper here. It shows how hard that this class is crazy because it feels like, you know, six receivers could go in the first round or something. But it, it almost feels like there's like nine or ten guys who could be, five, you know, there's like, five or six guys who could be that fifth or sixth. And there's not really a consensus who it's going to be. And then th that means there could be like 10 to 13 in the set in, through two rounds. Like Malik Washington is not a name I've even heard is probably in the first three rounds. There's like yeah. 15 to 17 guys. And it really seems like there's a lot of disagreement where there could be 10 to 12 guys that could go anywhere from like pick 25 to pick 75, which is just, which is just crazy in terms of what flavor, like if you're running a team, which guy who's athletic do you not really trust? Like an awesome athlete that maybe is in that bucket of like, he could go pretty high, but uh, that you're not really feeling. I, I haven't really had that. Well, I don't really have any like true full field athlete. I do think that the Xavier worthy four two one the speed part of it. If that, if that pushes him up in the first round, that's going to make me just a little bit nervous um, I think he's much better at doing like real wide receiver things than some of these other kind of smaller speed based receivers. But 
he's just not good at contested situations. He's a guy that's going to have to kind of be used in one of these specialized roles where he's full speed motion at the snap. That that's definitely great. Like pe- teams want viable target earners in that position now. So I can see the vision there depending on the coaching staff, but there are just a lot of other receivers that I prefer in terms of that can give you like high volume perspective, like high volume type of season. So He's one that if he went in the first round, I'd be a little nervous. If he went in the second round, I'm like, all right, I, I see where your vision is there. I, I To that point, I, I'm totally with you. A player like that with that skill set and that flash, uh, you got where he ends up is so important. Uh, and yeah. what coaching staff and what the surrounding talent is, you kind of you have to have a, a scheme that knows how to use a player like that. You kind of hit on um, a question Greggy yeah, I had. I was asking kind of who – to you might be more Laquan Treadwell well than Justin Jefferson. So a, a guy that is, so there, is there a guy to you out there other than, uh, other than four, two, one that jumps out to you as someone that you think is like, Ooh, if I were running a team, I'm staying away. Or, or do you just like this class enough where there aren't a lot of red flags out there? There's not a lot of red flags in terms of the, early guys because I know some people don't like A.D. Mitchell the other receiver from Texas I actually like him better than Xavier Worthy um, just because I, th- I think you see him do like real NFL X receiver things and I he's definitely a volatile prospect but I can understand chasing the upside there the guy that I've been kind of like back and forth on where my feeling on him de- changes depending on the game that I chart is Xavier Leggett who some people do have as a late first round pick to me that's definitely pretty rich um, despite the fact that he's got great tackle breaking ability and he shows an ability to get open on a certain routes um, at that size. It's very impressive to see him working out there. But at the same time, I do think he is a developmental player that might take a few years. And even like that type of, you know, average separator is typically like it matters even more where he ends up. Cause you've got to find the right quarterback to, to sort of see that, like sort of see that vision. If he's going to be an outside player, which I do think is going to be the case. Like I look at another guy, Keon Coleman, who's not a separator, but if you look at his reception perception profile, and I won't bore you guys with like the very hardcore percentile stats no, give with it this, to me. get dirty, get dirty with the numbers. <laughs> That's a there's drop. An, there's another, I was going to say, there's another drop. Um, but like over the, over the last few draft classes I've, I've charted, there's a handful of players that have been below the 35th percentile in success rate versus man, zone, and press coverage, or at least two of the three. Almost all of them have been total flameouts except five guys, and they've all become like big slot receivers. Like Rasheed Rice was an outside receiver who didn't really get open. He moved inside in the NFL, found career success in, in year one. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, he was good against zone coverage, but wasn't really great against man and press coverage. As an outside receiver at USC, moves in the slot, has a great season, has a great career. Obviously, Juju Smith-Schuster, another one, struggled beating man press coverage outside as a collegiate player, was a big slot receiver in his good years with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like I see that vision with Keon Coleman, where he's a guy that is below that 35th percentile mark in man and press coverage, but is a pretty solid zone beater, and he's pretty good on these routes, like dig routes and slant routes. And so if the right team takes him, you know, that has a coaching stat, like a, the Chiefs, they they take Rasheed Rice. I talked to Rasheed Rice at the Super Bowl, kind of asked him, like, when did the vision of you becoming this receiver, like a big slot receiver, sort of, when, when did that materialize? And he said it was right after he was drafted. And like Brett Veach talked about in the post-draft mm. presser, they saw him as like a juju kind of replacement for them, which was weird to me because he was mostly a pure outside receiver in college. So the right team takes Keon Coleman, has that vision for him. I can I can see that working out with Leggett because he's a – a ball winner and like he, he theoretically is is more of an uh, like a straight line athlete in my opinion I think he has to be an outside receiver and in that case it's going to take kind of the right team to really maximize that skill set he looks like the freakiest maybe of any of these play players yeah I mean, he's like it's a little worrisome that you're like a fifth year senior that you know for various reasons didn't have production before you were 23 playing against some 19 year olds but if you just like look at this man running down the field, he's he's a total. He looks like DK Metcalf or AJ Brown. So some team is gonna fall in love with that at, at some point and just try to make it work. And don't forget, Greg, that uh, Tommy Callahan, uh, son of Big Tom Callahan, after a rough start on the road with his colleague, ended up making Callahan's brake pads hugely successful in Tommy Boy. So just because you you might he was an eighth year senior, as I recall. 
and, and Tommy did just fine in the end. Mm. That was a trenchant point, Dan. Nice, Thank nice, you. Uh, nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. Last thing before we let you go, Matt, because I know you're busy. Wither Brock Bowers. Mm. I don't chart tight ends, man. No, oh, wow. I love it. I love it. I love a man that draws what about a line after in the last sand. Year? Last year was a it, great Greg. year for the Greg, tight that's, end. The man has okay. a code. Respect yeah. the code. Respect the is, methodology. It is a, it is a serious code um, because the Kyle Pitts bros have been, you know, banging on my door for years now about like, where's our Kyle Pitts reception perception chart. And I have two reasons why I only stick to the wide receiver position. One mm. is kind of the, the, the statistical reason that I've been doing reception perception now on these wide receivers for 10 plus years. Like, you know, I, I've been working on this for a long time. I have a very understanding of what the data show, very good understanding of what the data shows us, right? Like you, you score this against man coverage. I understand where your position should be. I should understand like what thresholds are that all that type of stuff to, to start a whole new database with tight ends. We're starting from square one. The second reason is <laughs> can I, if I can work blue on this show, I got enough shit on my plate. Okay. There like go, I got, okay. enough, I got okay. enough wide receivers on my plate, right? We're talking about there's, you mentioned it, Greg. There's going to be guys that come off the board in the third round that I'm not going to have a route chart for, and it's going to it's hey, going to make me nervous. It's going to make me feel uh, weird. Harman, let's uh, be fair though. We began this conversation with you saying James Coe, your partner with Reception Perception, who by the way is one of the great showmen and hosts. But he wants to bite at the apple, and he wants to start studying. He wants to start charting. Give him tight ends. Throw him that bone. And let's expand I, the property. I would love to, uh, James, this is your call. Step up to the plate, buddy. Uh, contribute, contribute to the, Whoa. to the charting here. I mean, listen, the, this is what we did with Derek Klassen, who does great work on quarterbacks. Um, I was like, Hey, Derek is a free agent, uh, not working for football outsiders anymore. Let's get him to chart quarterbacks for reception, And that's what he does now. So it, 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 aspiring tight end whisperer out there. Yeah, this is, this is your call. Come, come chart go. tight ends for reception perception and that's how we'll get it done. Yeah, I just don't. I don't think. I don't think like tight end perception is going to work well on certain uh, corners of the internet. But that's okay. You couch it inside of your your. I mean, it could be work it great. Yeah. I was going to say it'll work great, little, but it may not. That's a little a little backdoor entry uh, to get into the data. <laughs> Nailed it, oh, Matt Harmon at Matt Harmon <laughs> underscore byb on Twitter. Uh, sorry, Mark X. Uh, also check him out on Yahoo and of course receptionperception.com, which has everything. In the wide, rece wide receiver realm, and if we're lucky, tight ends very soon. Matt, mm. you're the best, buddy. Appreciate you boys for having me. Uh, yeah, this is awesome, and can't wait to see where these guys actually get drafted and so we can have a real conversation about what oh, I can't wait. Play. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Miss get you, Matt. Get draft. Thank you, Bye, Matt. Miss you guys, too. See ya. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll put a button on this one. All right, welcome back. And uh, yeah, I got to get me myself a mythology. I mean, that's that does. Uh, we didn't have if we had you more time. Do have a mythology. I think you're talking about like a methodology. You've created quite a mythology of, of oh mythology. Of yeah, methodology is I think methodology. What you want. Methodology. Mythology. Mythology. That's what you, you got. Yeah. You've got that down. Um, yeah. I think the methodology part of it. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, I, I think you're, you've got a lot going on too. Just like Matt was saying, like it would probably take about a hundred plus hours a week to create some <laughs> sort of rival site to this. And you starting it back in 2013 would have been a, a wise move. I don't, are you ready to take that on now? Well, it's just like, how does one come up with a methodology? Like how does one, like how does that originate within one's own brain? That, that to me is something that uh, I, I aspire to have an idea come into my mind that makes me think, not only is this an interesting idea, this might be a methodology. I mean, <laughs> I, this is not the way you use the word methodology. You have done that, Dan. Like, the, this is that podcast. The, the way you um, create different episodes of the shows <laughs> and uh, heighten certain characteristics from other people. And that's, yeah, that, act, well, that's, that is your methodology. That's very For nice. Real, right? That's the correct usage. But that's not what I'm thinking of. I want yeah. something like Matt has where people come off like, whoa, that guy is smart. <laughs> that guy has his own methodology. Yeah, I mean, people, people are like trumpeted. listening to ATN and be like, whoa, Dan really nailed his methodology this week. But part of your mythology is this like state mandated. Did you say mythology? Flagged hardcore. Yeah. I mean, no, part of your mythology, though, 
is the fact that you're notoriously um, ill at math, that you don't have any skills <laughs> at math, so you can't market. You'd that's have to reverse true. market that. Let's. Uh, that's true. Okay, let's let's talk about Zach Zenner real quick. Undrafted rookie out of South Dakota State, Mark, the preseason rushing leader in 2016 uh, when he rushed for a buck 83 on 35 totes, 5.2 yards per carry. It didn't really translate, uh, and Zach is obviously long gone from the league, but uh, he is active on social media. I just came across this late in our conversation with Maddie. Here it is, Zach Zenner, 31, follow him. When someone tells me I don't have time, I think they don't have a strategy. I had 25 minutes to eat lunch and shower and no prepped food, parentheticals, yesterday. Put two salmon fillets in the air fryer, showered, then ate it with some veggies and supplements. Still made my 2 p.m. Part two. <laughs> <laughs> Was it my best meal? No, but I got my protein in and the nutrients came from unprocessed whole food sources. The key was that I had a plan in case I didn't have time to prepare my typical lunch. Strategies and plans are crucial for any goal, especially healthy and wellness. There you go. So Zach See, is on the path to he's got his own methodology around health, fitness and wellness. So he's on that that path in life. I think I if you if you look back at it, I, I from a certain angle, I properly scouted him. Uh, which angle would that be exactly? I mean, we're, we're 10 years later and he couldn't be more successful. He's writing long mantras about air fryers and showering. Yeah, and he's sure. got, he got almost, almost 4,000 views on that first tweet. I'm sure he's a blast at parties. Uh, he was in the news recently, as, as Matt said, that he's taken his MCAT. Um, and he actually has a nutrition company. So it all, it all, and he, he wants to be an agent. So he's got a lot, a lot of things going on and, um, you know, now we've got some uh, some white receivers to fill his his place. I, w- I was surprised he went Pearsall there too, by the way, because Pearsall was a guy who didn't didn't get me going watching him. Because those guys, it's a it's kind of a cliche that to say that the white guys fit better in the slot, and they tested oh, out Greg, out of the come gym. On, There's got to no, be no, a no. better way to put that. Well, but it's true. What do you mean? I, well, go that's on. like a a big cliche that you put the white guys in the slot. There's, there's not many white outside receivers for a long time. And these guys have crazy athletic scores, but Pearsall really is a slot guy. And that kind of limits, I think where we would go. And McConkie, he, he mentioned like was not beating outside press coverage. Like it was not the, the type of receiver that you would normally see go one, but he, he snaps, he moves well, like in, in some teams going to fall. Don't you think McConkie is like pretty fun to watch? I mean, I'd spend yes. like, yeah, yes. I didn't spend hours right after yet, the but- catch. I could is he see connected him working to the former Giants teams. great who had the circus He's not. catch that's, in 21? That's what, got me, that's what put me in the doorway because I was like, is he related to Phil McConkey? And, and no, there's no, no relation. How about really? that catch in 21? According to the internet, that. I mean, I guess if you, I mean, if, you know, if you, went, if you dug deep into the family tree, you know, I'm sure there is, but it's not like his son or something. Big Funk, can you uh, dig deep into the McConkey family tree and see <laughs> if the former New York Giants wide receiver, teammate of Sean Landena, I believe, Mark, uh, yes. who had a circus catch in Super Bowl XXI against the Denver Broncos, uh, if he is related in any way to the highly lauded draft prospect, Lad McC- McConkey. Lad, L-A-double-D, McConkey. Thank you. Anything else, boys? It was fun. It, it's such a crazy draft that there's guys... Like a Troy, like Troy Franklin, he's got an outside chance to get drafted in the first round. Like we didn't even mention Harrison or whatever. There's just, it's almost hard to like figure out which one is which guy here. Like Texas, for instance, has two. We we mentioned that could both go in the first round in in Worthy and Ad Mitchell. There's just like guy upon guy upon guy, and that's good because as we talked about, there's like a million teams that have needs at the position. And you're right. It feels almost strange uh, not to dig in on Marvin Harrison Jr. in this episode the one with the wide receivers. But I will say this. Uh, he is number two on Daniel Jeremiah's top 50 uh, 2024 NFL prospects that he just put out. And I don't agree with the decision, but I don't have uh, full control of things. Like, we will have Jeremiah on the show uh, next week. And let's dig in on Harrison when when he is with us. Uh, one last thought. Uh, because we have so many potentially um, high-end wide receivers, or certainly at the very least sought-after wide receivers. And a reminder that not everything works. And, of course, uh, Matt Harmon is going to be 
tracking this on RP reception perception. And a lot of these guys are going to pop, but sometimes it just, just doesn't translate. I thought about with this many wide receivers, this position, it's probably, if you probably really do the dive, it's probably not that out of the ordinary. It certainly happens with the quarterback position for obvious reasons, but teams can go on runs in the first round. Two years come to mind, 2023 last year, four straight wide receivers. Seattle took JSN at 20. The chargers took Quentin Johnson. Man. At 21, uh, Baltimore took Zay Flowers at 22, and then Jordan Addison went to the Vikings at 23. And then I had mentioned Laquan Treadwell, who um, did not work out for Minnesota. Uh, He was part of another run in 2016 when Houston took Will Fuller at 21. Uh, Washington took Josh Doxson at 22, and then Treadwell at 23. None of those guys uh, really made it. Well, Fuller almost did, but then disappeared. Strange. Um, So... I wonder if we're going to get that, if we're going to get a, this year another one where we get a run of three or even four guys in a row. I think we will, but I think also we're going to get, I still look at, I know it looks like the best class we've ever had during our show, um, clearly, but 40% of them aren't going to be on the same team hmm. three years from now. I, I just Receiver like, is I, different though. Receiver has hit well. Like you look at that AJ Brown class and granted those guys, it was crazy because they went in the second and McLaurin was in the third. They were all over the place. A, a lot of the, like it, it to me, it's hit at a higher uh, level than other positions. And the difference this year is like, I, I'm pretty confident Brian Thomas would have gotten drafted over all those receivers last year. And he's four here. Like, I think he'll go top, top 12, top 15. So it is a better class than I think we've seen in the last few. It, then there'll be some boomer bust guys after that. Well, and like a rookie wide receiver contract is very valuable too. But I, yeah. I, I'm just saying, I'm telling you. Let's 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 talk in four years and see where we are. They're not all going to be starters and number one dudes. All right, Mark, we get it. You know, I mean, I don't know because I'm even like tough. I was like looking at, but we don't like, have to dwell dra- on it because we, you know I was looking at the draft class from just like three years ago and it, it, I find it relatively depressing. Which one? Just like in general, what's happened to tons of players that we were squawking about, and I'm not, you know, I get it. I'm not trying to go down that path, but it's like, oh, Mark. You cynical son of a bitch. What? <laughs> I'm with you, though, but I, I think it's like... It's I'm with you. Similar... I, I said it first, but I, you know, we don't need to hammer yeah. it home. That it's many of these guys will it. not play. I, I'm tapping it. I'm just... All right. How about, how about though 2022 would be the closest comp, but this one would probably be viewed as better. Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Olave. I mean, those are all hits. How bang, about that? Bang, bang. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the first five guys. I mean, we're talking about like there's 16, like 20 people. Right. Like the comps for the bottom 10 are... A lot of them are just sort of normal wide receivers. So I, whatever, we'll see. We're we shall talk in half a decade. I will be right. Yes, we will circle back in exactly half a decade. Uh, finally, one bit of uh, update here. Uh, Big Funk, who never shies away from any challenge, including incredible uh, Photoshop work on the 2024 San Diego Graybeards Media Guide. Uh, he has an update, according to Randy. This is a direct quote. There is no reported relation between uh, 80s McConkey and 2020s McConkey. Well, that was what Mark said. That was he my report. reported it. <laughs> right, but we threw it to Randy. So if you want, if it makes it feel more official, uh, Randy is um, officially going on record that there is no relation. Well, I appreciate I appreciate Randy, but it doesn't feel any more official to me because I went and researched it like mm. like this week myself. But that's fine. I. Oh, He's, if this isn't good enough it. for you, Randy says, we'll take this, Mr. Cynic. The McConkey name originates from Irish Del Riata. No, Del Riata. Del de Riata. It's Gaelic, I guess. So while not direct, there may be something somewhere down the line. Well, sure. We're all so, related somewhere down the line if you go far enough back. <laughs> you know what? I think that's that's a great way to the end, end the episode, uh, Greg, that we are all, uh, we all bleed red. And uh, we might not all look the same, uh, but we are one, even if we are not the same. Till Monday, heed the call.